Hey there, guys. I hope everybody is doing well as you uh, come to this lesson on how we're going to be talking polar coordinates and graphs. What we're going to be looking at uh, specifically in this lesson, it kind of gives you, uh, here's a whole bunch of technical stuff about what uh, are, are, are things that may be covered in this material. But uh, specifically, we're going to be converting uh, rectangular coordinates into polar coordinates or vice versa. Uh, looking at rectangular graphs and how we, you know, graph them, and um, what else are we going to be doing? We're going to be doing some things with uh, derivatives. We're going to need a calculator, and we're going to be kind of looking at some things in common between a rectangular function and its polar equivalent. Uh, so here, let me get rid of this here because. Uh, I was having some issues with my board with the orientation, and I, I guess I accidentally saved some scratch marks there. But uh, here, this is what we're talking about when we say rectangular uh, coordinate stuff. That's the Cartesian coordinate system. That's the stuff that you started doing back in, like, I don't know, middle school maybe. You know, what's how do you plot a point? What's X, what's Y kind of thing. Um it allows us to identify uh, something on a plane. If we do it with three numbers, we can do it in three dimensions. And uh, let's see, the equations corresponding to these graphs have been either in rectangular or parametric form so far. Yes, they have. Uh, in polar coordinates, the point in the plane is defined by a pair of numbers, r, the radius, and theta, an angle uh, made from the x-axis in quadrant one. Uh, the number theta measures the angle between, I just, okay, positive x-axis, called the polar axis, and a ray that passes through that point. Let's see. Here, the number r measures the directed distance from the pole. Yeah, here's some vocabulary that you need to make sure that we understand. Here, when we're talking about uh, polar coordinates, when we say pole, we're referring to the origin of the function, or the graph, I should say. And here, this is uh, something that, if you've taken pre-cal, this may have been something that you got to kind of towards the end of the year, where this is kind of how we uh, identify, you know, what the x and y coordinates are going to be in terms of, uh, you know, how we convert rectangular and polar coordinates from one uh, version to another. So here, polar to rectangular, rectangular to polar, either way, it's really just kind of based off of uh, based off of a right triangle. If we had something coming this way, something coming this way, you know, think about it, I don't know, maybe in terms of like a vector, you know, where we'd have like a resulting vector here uh, almost. Uh, we, we're just thinking about this, uh, you know, this is your x-axis. This is your y-axis. Uh, and really, probably think about it more in terms of things we did to put the unit circle together. This is your radius, okay? And here is theta. Well, what is x? X is going to be the, you know, if you're looking at it in terms of theta, uh, x is the adjacent side. And the R value is the hypotenuse. So adjacent and hypotenuse, that's why we're working with cosine there. Uh, opposite over hypotenuse for Y, that's why we're using sine for Y. And if I'm going to have to figure out what the value of R is, you know, he, because this is just a right triangle, there's a Pythagorean theorem. And tangent, opposite over adjacent, you know, that's why we're using tangent to... Uh, with the two sides that we have, uh, y and x, to, to find the value of theta. So here it's just asking us to convert the following polar coordinates uh, into rectangular coordinates. Now remember, uh, polar coordinates are given in the terms of r and theta. So uh, 4 here represents a radius in example a. And 2 pi over 3 is going to be an angle uh, on the unit circle. So if I want to know x, I'm going to say x is equal to, nope, 
forgot my R. R cosine of theta. So I'm going to say here x is going to be equal to 4 uh, cosine of 2 pi over 3. And 2 pi over 3 on the unit circle for cosine is going to be at negative 1 half. So that's negative 1 half here. So my x coordinate is negative 2. And so now let's do the y coordinate. So y is r times sine of theta. So we just do the same basic substitution here. 4 times sine of 2 pi over 3. And 2 pi over 3 the for sine, the y coordinate there, is going to be radical 3 over 2. So it's going to give me y is equal to 4 times radical 3 over 2. And that would simplify to be 2 radical 3. So the rectangular coordinates that are equivalent to the polar coordinates of 2 comma 2 pi or, or 4 comma 2 pi over 3 are going to be negative 2 and 2 radical 3. And this one is done basically the same way. I'm not going to go into as much detail on this one simply because there's a lot of material that we want to cover here. Uh, but when I substitute here, I'm going to say x is equal to uh, the square root of 5 times cosine pi over 6. So in this case, x works out to be, uh, here I'm going to have actually the square root of 15 over 2. And for y, we're going to say square root of 5 times the sine of pi over 6. I don't know why I put that one in parentheses when I didn't put the other ones. But uh, here, y is going to wind up equaling radical 5 over 2. And square root of 15 over 2 and radical 5 over 2. And there is the rectangular coordinates. Uh, feel free to work that out in a little bit more detail if you need to. Uh, kind of like how I did on the left, for example, A. But this is fairly straightforward stuff. It's not going to be fairly, com it's not super complicated. Obviously, understanding your unit circle is going to play a big role in making sure you understand, you know, what numbers we wind up getting and working with. But uh, here we're going to go the opposite direction. So let's look at C here. C, we want to convert the rectangular stuff into polar stuff. Uh, so if we take the rectangular stuff uh, to find R, uh, R was given to us to be R squared. Uh, it was literally just a Pythagorean theorem. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and write it in this form where we're going to say R is going to be equal to, uh, in this case, X squared plus Y squared. Uh, so here, I'm going to wind up getting uh, r to be equal to the square root of negative 2. Oop, I forgot my negative sign. Started to write negative and then started to write 2 at the same time. Negative 2 squared plus 2 radical 3 squared. Now, most of this stuff should be something that you can kind of do without a calculator. Uh, negative 2 squared is a 4. Uh, 2 radical 3 squared is going to be uh, 4 times 3. That's 12. So plus 12. That's going to be the square root of 16. So the R value in this case is going to be a 4. And to find theta, I know it gave us uh, this. This is what it, what it gave us in our notes. Tangent of theta is equal to uh, y over x, opposite over adjacent. But we're trying to solve for theta. So to me, it makes a little bit more sense to just say theta is equal to the inverse tangent of y over x. And now uh, that I have that, let's go ahead and see what we wind up with. So inverse tangent, or arctan if you prefer, is going to be 2 radical 3 over negative 2. So I wind up with uh, arctan of negative radical 3. 
and negative radical 3 on your unit circle is going to wind up putting you at theta to be negative pi over 3 for tangent. Oh, I don't want to put that one in the box. Oh, that erased too much. Negative pi over 3. So the, uh, the polar coordinates would be 4 and negative pi over 3 like so. And I'm going to, again, kind of do the second one in a little bit less detail than what I did uh, for the first one. Here I'm going to wind up saying that r is going to be equal to the square root of 5 plus negative 5. And we got to square both of those. And so ideally, y'all are going to be able to recognize that that would be like a right isosceles triangle. Uh, this is going to follow your 45, 45, 90 rules. So this works out to be a radius of 5 radical 2. Uh, theta, in this case, if I say theta is equal to tan inverse, I'm going to say uh, negative 5 over 5, which would be uh, negative 1. So theta, in this case, inverse tangent of negative 1. Uh, on your unit circle will put you at negative pi over 4. So my coordinates would be 5 radical 2, and I don't know why I put a comma there, 5 radical 2, comma, negative pi over 4 for theta. And that is how we convert uh, rectangular and polar co coordinates from one form to the other. So now we're going to take that same skill that we were just doing and we're going to apply it to trying to solve some uh, or convert some polar equ rectangular equations into polar equations and vice versa. Uh, and, and what we were doing, the skills that we just saw in the last four examples are basically the same thing that we're going to see here. Uh, it does say to verify with your calculator. I'm not going to graph these things and uh, take the time to, to put in a polar function and then a rectangular function so you can compare them. Go, You go ahead and do that on uh, a calculator uh, on your own. But in this case, uh, we want to convert the rectangular equation of y is equal to 4 into its polar uh, equivalent. Well, we've already been established that y is equal to the radius times the sine of theta. So I can say r sine theta is going to be equal to 4 in this case. And we can solve uh, this by we're, we're, basically what we're doing if we're trying to write a polar equation. A polar equation is going to be in terms of r is equal to something. So we're solving this equation for r. So I wind up with saying r is equal to 4 divided by sine of theta. And maybe you could stop there uh, since we do have r by itself. But because we have sine in the denominator, maybe we want the reciprocal of that. So that would be cosecant. So maybe I want it to be 4 cosecant of theta. And that one can be kind of tricky depending on what the answer choices are given to you as. I would expect the 4 over sine theta would be fine if you're doing something as a free response question. But maybe for a multiple choice question, probably they would give you 4 cosecant theta as opposed to 4 over sine theta. Uh, this one is going to be doing the same thing, but it's going to, example B is going to ask us to do it in two different uh, forms because now they're giving us both y and x. So I'm going to substitute the same thing for y. I'm going to say that uh, y is r sine theta and the x will become r cosine theta. So that's what we wind up with when we do our substitution, r cosine theta for x. And Again, we want to be able to try and get x or get r by itself in this case. So really, this is all just a basic algebra problem from this point on. I'm going to take the r values and kind of get them on one side. So 
uh, I guess I'll go ahead and take the three R cosine theta because I already have one trig thing on one side uh, on the left side. So here I'm going to say R sine theta minus three R cosine theta is equal to a two. We can factor the R as a common factor on the left side, giving me just sine of theta minus three times cosine of theta is to be equal to two. And then divide to get R by itself. So R in this case is going to be equal to two divided by sine of theta minus three cosine of theta. And I really don't see any point in trying to simplify that one any further. I'm going to just stop there. And the last one, feel free to go ahead and try and pause the video and work it out in advance. But basically, again, we're going to substitute uh, R sine theta for Y. We're going to substitute uh, R cosine theta for X. And in this case, we're going to square it. So when I square the right side, we have r sine theta on the left equals 2 times r squared cosine squared theta. Again, we're trying to get r by itself on one side. Let me give myself a little bit more space here. And uh, what I'm going to do is go ahead and divide both sides by r. So if I divide the left side by r, that's just going to be sine of theta. And if I divide the right side by r, that's going to be 2 times r cosine squared of theta. And now we can just kind of divide uh, by 2 cosine squared theta, and I can get sine of theta over 2 cosine squared theta to be equal to r. And again, that's perfectly fine, but uh, in this case, we can simplify this one a little bit more. Uh, we can say cosine times cosine in the bottom, so I'm going to get sine over cosine at one point, which would be a tangent, and 1 over cosine would be secant, so I can write this as 1 half uh, secant of theta times tangent of theta or tangent times secant, whichever you prefer, is equal to r. Either of these would be fine. And that's how we're converting rectangular equations into their polar equivalents. Feel free to try to graph them and make sure, you know, see what they're going to look like from one form to the other. And now we're going to go the other way around. We're going to take the uh, polar equations and try and convert them into their rectangular equivalents. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this first one here. What we're trying to do now is we want to we want to try and get something that will be in terms of say our sine of theta or our cosine of theta because those are going to represent our x's and y's. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I want to take the secant of theta that's on the right side of the equation and I want to move it to the side that has the R term because, again, X or Y is going to be something in terms of R sine of theta or R cosine of theta. So moving that over, uh, in this case, will give me R over secant of theta to be equal to negative 3. Well, secant is the reciprocal of cosine, so this becomes uh, r cosine of theta to be equal to negative 3, and r cosine of theta is just x equals negative 3. So that polar equation, r is equal to negative 3 secant of theta, is equivalent to a rectangular equation, x equals negative 3, a vertical line, and x is equal to negative 3. Here, uh, going back to the, or, or going on to example two, same idea. We want to try and get the x, or we want to try and get the r terms and the uh, anything that has trig stuff on the same side of the equal sign. So we want to take the term that's in the uh, denominator 
and we want to move it to the right side from the right side to the left side by multiplying and we can treat this like a proportion basically so if I multiply r by the denominator that's going to give me r plus 2r cosine theta to be equal to 4 okay so we know that r cosine of theta is x so I can just go ahead and rewrite this as r plus 2x is equal to 4. So what do I do with the other r? Uh, well, with the other r, we can, you know, now let's take the 2x and let's move it away. So that'll give me r is equal to 4 minus 2x. Well, one of the things that I know is that you know, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Uh, so if I square both of those, uh, I can ideally try and get something that would be in terms of x and y. So if I square the denominator, I'm, <laughs> the denominator, let's just say we're, we're going to square both sides here at this point. So that'll give me r squared to be equal to, and if I square that, that's going to wind up giving me 16 uh, minus 16x plus 4x squared. And we know that r squared is x plus y. So I'm going to replace the r squared on the left side with x squared plus y squared to be equal to 16 minus 16x plus 4x squared. And if you want to, we can, you know, I don't know which one we want to do. If we want to try and put everything on one side of the equal sign, um, what do we want our leading term to be? Mm, I don't know. I think we would, might wind up with something that says like 0 is equal to uh, so let's just say 4x squared, let's go ahead and write that first, minus the y squared, uh, minus 16x plus 16. Um, there's really not a pretty equation, a pretty solution to this one. I would probably say either of these would be uh, acceptable solutions as far as what the rectangular equation is. Not the most satisfying looking equation, but still an acceptable answer. And here we're going to kind of do the same thing. We want to, when we're converting from a rect uh, polar function into a rectangular function, we need to get the r and the trig stuff on one side of the equation. So we, we know what x and y are going to wind up being. So again, I'm going to kind of multiply the denominator to the side with r, and that'll give me r cosine theta plus 2r sine of theta is equal to 3. And this one's going to work out much nicer than the last one did, clearly, because our cosine of theta is x, our sine of theta is y, and there we go. That's a much nicer equation than what we had on the last one. Uh, and again, pick on that last one, just pick, pick how you want to write the equation. You know, do you want to get y by itself? Do you want to get y squared by itself? That that one's not going to be a pretty answer, no matter which way you look at it. But that's how we convert. Okay, hopefully that was enough looks, enough examples to kind of get you through it. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking a little bit about graphs. And part of the reason why we wanted to practice those conversions is so, so that we, we could, you know, know what the graph of something is going to look like. Okay. So, what do we know about this? We know that R, okay, what do the instructions say? Describe what you know about the graph of each polar equation, then convert uh, the polar equation to a rectangular equation and sketch the graph on the grid provided. Well, in this case, they're just, they're just giving us a basic R is equal to 3. That just means that we're going to have a circle with a radius of 3 centered uh, at the origin, really. So if I were going to just graph that one, 
On my polar stuff, each of these concentric circles is a radius. So from here to here, this would be a radius of 3. So I'm expecting this to kind of just look like that if we were going to graph it. Okay, convert it into a polar equation. Or I'm sorry, convert the polar equation into a rectangular equation and sketch it. Well, hopefully it'll be the same here. Let's see what happens. So... In this case, uh, again, uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to I'm going to just take this and I'm going to square both sides because I know that r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Uh, so I'm going to wind up with r squared being equal to three. So I have uh, just x squared plus y squared being a note three squareds being equal to nine so this is the equation of a circle in rectangular coordinates x squared plus y squared is equal to nine and that would have a radius of three uh, according to the standard equation of a circle so yeah they look like they're giving me the same thing there so good let's take a look at the next one here the next one is uh, same thing. Because they're giving me just that one R term, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to just take this whole equation. I'm going to multiply everything in this equation by R. So when I do that, that's going to give me R squared to be equal to uh, negative 3R sine of theta. And... The r squared is x squared plus y squared. The r sine of theta will give me minus 3y. Now this one's going to be a little bit more interesting. I can see what's going to happen with this one. Um, we, if we take this one and we put it in terms of, uh, let's see, what do we got here? Ba ba ba. Okay, let's put it in, turn, in kind of standard form, and I'm going to have x squared plus y squared equals, uh, nope, plus 3y is equal to 0. Okay, so let's think about what we have for the... Uh, for the polar function, okay? And, and again, a lot of this is going to kind of determine or depend on how much you know about polar functions from pre-cal. Uh, what this is telling us, sine, you know, we all know sine is vertical. And they're showing us that because we're doing something vertical, I, I, I'm going to have kind of a circular shape uh, vertically, okay? E either something above or below the x-axis. The 3 itself is the radius, and because it's negative, it's telling me that it's going to be below the uh, x-axis. So we're going to have something that, in this case, is going to have a radius of 3 below the x-axis. So a radius of 3 below the x-axis, uh, so let's say like this is 1, this is, you know, uh, or the way that they're counting, this is 2, so this is... Nope, I'm not counting that right, am I? Uh, let's see. I wonder if I have this written out right here. Uh, well, let's go ahead and finish converting this thing here and see what we end up with. Let me go ahead and finish converting it into rectangular form. Um, but generally speaking, because the sign is negative and it's sine we're going to be down here somewhere, okay? Now, right now, this is just a, a rough sketch. Uh, it's not not finished. So, how are we gonna take this? Because we know the standard rectangular uh, equation of a circle. The standard form for the equation of a circle is x minus h quantity squared plus y minus k quantity squared is equal to r squared, the radius squared. And right now, 
I kind of have something that I can work with X, but I don't have something in this format with the Y values that I have. So what I'm going to do with the Y values only is I'm going to complete the square on the Y values only. And when I complete the square on the Y values only, I'm going to have something that looks like that. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's bring down the, uh, let's just forget the, the X exists for the time being. Let's just focus on Y squared plus three Y uh, being equal to zero. Now, of course, if we were doing this uh, in terms of completing the square, we would factor out the A term, which in this case would just be a one. So I have Y squared. Uh, plus 3y, and then we're going to get some new number, which is going to be the middle term, the b term, divided by 2 squared. So negative, or 3 over 2 squared is just going to be 9 fourths. I don't have a c term to bring on the outside of the parentheses, and I'm going to subtract the same number that I got inside of the parentheses, 9 fourths here, and that is all equal to 0. So when I finish completing the square with that one, this is going to wind up being a y plus a 3 over 2 squared uh, being equal to positive 9 fourths. Uh, so the radius, that's the radius squared, so the square root of that would be 3 over 2 or 1 and a half. So the radius is actually going to be 1 and a half, not 3. So the radius is 1 and a half. So the radius is 1 and a half, so that's why I was kind of wanting to go there. And then we're going to have uh, a circle that, you know, we'll have one here. Uh, one, horizontally, one and a half, that one's going to be a little bit harder to find. So I'm going to just kind of, I don't know, where are we at? Maybe uh, about here? Maybe about here, something like that? We're going to have a circle that looks kind of something like that. And it's below the x-axis because of the negative sign on the 3. And... So, and I forgot to bring down my x squared, so let's just bring down the x squared plus that. Now we have something that's in the standard form of a circle in rectangular form, and there we go. So that is a circle that uh, has been shifted down one and a half spaces, and the radius is going to be one and a half. And my, my circle is a little lopsided, but there, there we go. So the last one here is going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, I hope by now you're seeing that we want to get R and our trig stuff on the same side. So when I multiply both sides by, or mul cross multiply essentially, multiply R by cosine of theta, I'm going to just wind up with R cosine of theta to be equal to 5. Well, that's just X is equal to 5. So X is equal to 5 is going to be a vertical line. So I'm going to just go to where X is equal to 5 and draw a vertical line through it and say, okay, we got that graph. All right. So we have converted successfully some uh, polar functions into rectangular functions. And we only had to remember one real kind of obscure Algebra 2 stuff uh, with the completing the square, but we've practiced that in other aspects of calculus. So. Anyway, let's take a look at what we're seeing here. Uh, here, this is where it's telling you to use an auxiliary graph to sketch polar curves because uh, sometimes if you know points on a rectangular function, it can kind of help you figure out where points on its polar equivalent are going to lie. Uh, and then here, it's telling us, consider the function y is equal to 1 minus 2 sine of x over the interval from pi, 0 to 2 pi, and its relationship to the polar graph. Uh, R is equal to 1 minus 2 sine of theta. 
Uh, since there will be unique y values in the domain, we can use the table below to assist us in graphing the polar graph. Uh, consider the values for uh, yx as they correspond directly to the polar equation as r theta and use it to sketch the polar function. Now, I'm going to be uh, a, a little frank here. This is not my favorite example. I don't think it does uh, a particularly uh, good job of, of demonstrating what we're doing here. But uh, what is it showing you here? Now, first of all, ideally, again, we have some kind of prior knowledge for uh, what our polar functions are going to look like when we are working with them in uh, you know, trying, trying to sketch a graph of it by, by hand. Uh, in this case, based on what we know for uh, the negative on the sign, we know we're going to have something that's going to be vertical because the negative on the sign is going to be below the x-axis. So we're going to have something circular kind of below the x-axis. And 0 to 2 pi is basically showing us that we're going to complete one full thing because it's just going to essentially it's going to kind of just repeat itself, which is pretty typical for periodic trig functions. And let's see what we end up with here. And I have something I wanted to look at here. So just very quickly, very quickly, OK? And I'm not very good at remembering these names. A limason uh, is going to be equal to A plus or minus B uh, times either the sine of theta, or it can be A plus minus B times the cosine of theta. Now, if the absolute value of the A to B ratio is less than one, that means that we have an inner loop, okay? So uh, cosine would look something like this. Cosine positive would kind of look something like this. We, we would, we'd have something that looks like that. Not really pretty. So with sine, uh, with our negative sine something, we're going to have, just generally speaking, I know sine's going to go up and down because it's negative. It's going to be below the x-axis. So I know generally speaking it's going, and I didn't start that at the right spot. I need to start at the, the pole. I would have kind of a circle going like that uh, where we have an inner loop. Okay, if the uh, inner loop, I'm sorry, if that A to B value, if the A to B ratio is equal to 1, that is going to be something called a cardioid. And I think somebody named that because it, it kind of has a heart shape. A cardioid has a pole at the, or it starts at the pole, and then it kind of goes like that because there's no inner loop. And so I, I guess that's a heart cardioid. And if the absolute value of that ratio of A to B, if the absolute value of the ratio from A to B uh, is greater than 1 but less than 2, this would be called a dimpled dimpled limason where uh, you know it's going to be still vaguely sh circular is going to look a lot more like a circle but it's going to kind of have like a, a little bit more of a flatter region here and it'll go like that 
and if the ratio is going to be greater than two, then that's where we're entering the realm of something that looks much more uh, circular. But anyway, so I, I again, understanding the kind of function that we have, I understand that I'm going to have something that looks like this for my function, for the polar function, I should say. And let's see where we're going to wind up with this. So where do the uh, where does the inner loop come from? Well, the inner loop is going to come from this region right here. Oops, picked the wrong thing here. Want my highlighter? The inner loop winds up coming from where we have our negative values uh, for y. That's what creates the inner loop. And you can know that it's going to be periodic. It's going to repeat itself over and over and over again. So uh, it's going to just kind of have that same shape going and going and going. So let's see. Oh, this is where I just kind of copied the table so they looked a little bit better. OK. So here, this is the graph of what we should have wound up with. And we're taking the. Uh, points that we were given from the um, rectangular form from the table that we had and we're using those to kind of help us see where the values are going to be located. So if we uh, come back here, what was the, oops, The lowest point on the y numbers, the lowest value on the y numbers, the absolute maximum for that negative region was at negative 1. And if I look at the cardioid that I have, that is as that's the radius of that inner loop. And that's how we're able to use those rectangular points with our uh, our t with our polar stuff and, and be able to get our polar function and, and see what it would look like. This is why we're saying it's an auxiliary graph. Okay. Uh, if I go back and look at the table here, the absolute greatest uh, number that we went to on the negative, or I'm sorry, the B, 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 what am I talking about? I had something in my mind and then it, it vanished. I really should have just deleted that page, but anyway, coming down here, we have a radius overall uh, from here to here, one, two, three for the uh, overall uh, length from the pole to its uh, furthest edge, which said radius, I probably should have said diameter. And we can kind of see here uh, the absolute greatest length is a length of three. So, but the negative numbers are what creates the inner loop, and the outer, because of the loop being below the x axis there, the rest of it follows below the x axis, creating this shape here. Now, I got to point out. Uh, those of you in my class following along with this stuff, your handout probably looks a little bit different. That's because I am, <laughs> I don't know how, but the the wrong, uh, wrong image got added to the document. Uh, so this would basically be the same thing if instead of saying sign, if this said uh, R, oh, if this said r was equal to 1 minus 2 cosine of theta, that's what this one would be. Cosine is you know, related to the horizontal motion, the x numbers. So this one, because it's negative, is going to be to the left of the y-axis uh, as opposed to the right side for a positive value uh, going into the cosine. But that... That is the image that was on your on your paper. So if you're a little confused, 
I get it, but uh, I wasn't able to change the value that we had there or the image that we had on it. So now we're going to be taking a look at an old favorite in calculus. Can we find the slope of tangent lines and possibly write equations of uh, lines that are going to be tangent to a curve at a particular point? Now this one is, this next example, I'm going to just let you know, it's going to require you to have a calculator just for arithmetic purposes. We're not going to be graphing anything for this one. But uh, a point of distinction that we need to make sure that we understand here, if y is equal to f of theta is a differentiable function, then the slope of the tangent line uh, at the point r theta on the graph of r is equal to f of theta is this whole thing. Okay. Now, I want to make sure that you understand this is really the important thing here. dy dx is not the derivative of y with respect to x because we're talking about something in a polar form. We're saying the derivative of y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta also. And it's giving us, you know, some, th this whole clunky thing that we have here. It's not just the derivative of y, uh, of, of what you think might be y. It's the derivative of y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. So there's going to be more complicated derivatives here when we're working with the polar functions. Okay. And this is one of the reasons why we're going to need a calculator for this one. And uh, for sure, the next one, <laughs> we have some pretty funny calculators that are pretty funny looking derivatives that we're going to wind up working with. So key features about the derivatives of polar equations uh, here, dy d theta is going to be equal to zero, provided dx d theta is not equal to zero. If they're both equal to zero, then both, uh, then, then the entire, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. Uh, I didn't look at the, column, the, the first row, horizontal tangent lines. Uh, if the numerator obviously is going to be zero, we have a horizontal tangent line. If the uh, denominator is going to be equal to zero, we have a vertical tangent line. And if they're both equal to zero, we can't draw a conclusion. Okay, so here, find the points at which the cardioid, this is one where the ratio of the a value and the b value are going to be equal to one and that's kind of what we see here you know this is a here i would have a, a another one that would be the b value so that's why i know it's kind of dimpled at the pole there has uh let's see find the points at which the cardioid has vertical or horizontal tangent lines uh use a graphing utility to check your findings now you're more than welcome to check the uh, get on a graphing calculator and check your findings if you want to but uh, I think the graph that's provided for us here will be sufficient when we have our answers and really what I want to use the calculator for is to just do some arithmetic because we're going to wind up with some decimal numbers that's unavoidable so remember we know that x is equal to r cosine theta we know that y is equal to r sine theta. And based on what we know uh, with the expression as it was given to us, we have 1, r is equal to, uh, I'm lost my, lost my, Losing my mind, apparently, r is equal to 1 plus cosine theta. So here, I'm going to be looking at uh, hmm. I know that x, My notes aren't making sense to me for some reason. X is equal to uh, 
Hold on a second. I need a moment. Breather. Pause. Okay. So, I'm all cleared up now. I was having a hard time understanding my notes, but we're good now. So, I'm going to take the value as it was given to me for the radius. So I'm going to take that and I'm going to substitute it here. And I'm going to substitute it here. And I'm going to find out what x and y are going to be equal to. So r being 1 plus cosine of theta gets multiplied to the cosine of theta for x. And x is going to be cosine of theta plus cosine squared of theta. And we'll do the same thing for y. So I'm going to say y is equal to 1 plus cosine of theta times sine of theta. And distribute here. And y is going to be equal to sine of theta plus sine of theta cosine of theta. And now we have our values for x and y that we can take our derivatives with. Okay, so let me switch colors here because uh, let's do, I guess we'll do this one here in uh, pink. So we'll say dx d theta. Uh, you could probably just say x prime if you wanted to for your own notes. But uh, dx d theta is we need to take the derivative of this expression. So the derivative of cosine will be negative sine theta. And for the cosine squared, that's going to use the chain rule. So the derivative overall is going to be uh, negative sine. So the derivative of the inside, so, so here I'm going to wind up negative 2 sine of theta cosine of theta cosine of theta and because I do have sine common between those I'm going to go ahead and factor out these the negative sign I'm going to say negative sine of theta uh, times 1 plus cosine of theta nope I forgot my two one plus two cosine of theta. So there's the derivative of x with respect to theta. So now let's take the derivative of y with respect to theta. So dy d theta. Same thing. Uh, derivative of sine gives me cosine of theta. Uh, here I have to use the product rule with sine and cosine. Um, so that's going to be uh, plus, and we'll just leave sine alone, sine, and the derivative of cosine will be negative sine of theta. I forgot theta here. Uh, plus, and so now the derivative of sine is going to be cosine of theta times cosine of theta. That didn't look very nice. Cosine of theta. So simplify this a little bit. Cosine theta. And that'll be minus sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta. And let's see. According to the basic trig identity, sine squared plus cosine squared, I can rewrite this whole thing. Uh, I'm going to keep simplifying this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to take the cosine of theta. Obviously, I'm not doing anything with that. But I'm going to move the cosine squared, cosine squared. And kind of just off to the side, remember that 
you know, sine of square or sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta is equal to one. Uh, so we can rewrite the sine squared bit in terms of cosine. So that'll be minus uh, one minus cosine of squared of, uh, of theta. And by doing that, uh, we're going to wind up with, if I distribute the negative sign in, I'm going to wind up with two cosine squareds, two cosine squareds of theta. And I have one cosine of theta. And I have a minus one. And some of you are going to be wondering, well, Mr. Piercy, why are you going through all that extra stuff? Why couldn't you have just kind of, couldn't you have maybe stopped here, uh, you know, at that one? And yeah, we could have. Um, but what are we trying to find? We're trying to find horizontal or vertical tangent lines. And dy d theta is going to go to the numerator. So because that's going to go to the numerator of the derivative of the polar function, we want this one in this case probably to be everything in, in terms of the same trig function. So that's why I have, I, I, I kept working it until I got everything in terms of cosine, okay? So now I have dy d theta and I have dx d theta. So now let's go ahead and go back here to blue. So now we have dy dx in this case is going to be uh, 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine of theta minus 1 over the negative sine theta times 1 plus 2 cosine of theta. And so now we have our derivative. So we're looking for horizontal tangent lines. So let's see, what would be a good color to do horizontal tangent lines? And let's kind of do orange or something, I guess. So here, let's look for our horizontal tangent lines. Now, forget what we have right now. Uh, for you know, I, I know that this may be difficult to see. But what I have in the numerator is the same thing as saying 2x squared plus x minus 1. That, the whole reason why I took the extra steps that I did to find dy d theta was so that way I could have everything in terms of one trig operation that would make it relatively easy to solve for theta. And in this case, I can treat this like it is a quadratic form a quadratic function in the numerator. So I'm going to use the uh, quadratic formula here. And I'm going to say cosine of theta, and I'm going to just use a quadratic formula. And this is what I want my calculator for, really. Uh, I'm going to say negative 1 uh, opposite of b plus minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c negative 1, negative 1, all of it divided by 2a, so in this case it will be 2 times 2, and negative 1 plus minus, so we get, uh, that'll be 9 here over 4, giving me uh, negative 1 plus 3 uh, over 2. Uh, so negative 1 plus 3 will be 2 over 4. So I'll get a 1 half. And negative 3 minus 3 will be negative 4 over 4, which would be negative 1. So I have a negative 1. And let's go ahead and just reverse those real quick. Let's do 
negative one and positive one half, negative one and positive one half, because those are going to be numbers that we're going to be substituting. Because remember, this is cosine of theta. So what is theta equal to? When is uh, what angles are going to give me those numbers for cosine? And in this case, the negative one would give me a pi, and the positive one half could work out to be either a positive or a negative pi over three. So these are the points that which I would have my horizontal tangent lines at. So let's see what would be good for vertical tangent lines. Let's do this purple color, I guess. So the vertical tangent lines are obviously going to come from the denominator. Uh, so vertical tangent lines. So I have negative sine of theta times 1 plus 2 cosine theta. Uh, and in this case, I really only need to focus on this. Here, vertical tangent lines are going to exist anywhere the denominator is zero. Well, if this is zero, If I know what values of theta will make sine zero, zero multiplied, it doesn't matter what, what we get inside the parentheses, we're multiplying by zero, we're going to have a zero in the denominator. So what makes sine of theta equal to zero? And in this case, sine of theta is going to be equal to zero. So theta will be equal to zero at uh, zero. Uh, pi, two, no, two pi over three, and four pi over three, because, well, zero is going to be, well, maybe I'm oversimplifying that a little bit. Because these two don't make sine uh, zero. Sine is going to be zero at uh, zero or pi. And we already have pi written down. Uh, but pi would be zero. OK. So at, because I could have zero here at pi, oh. at zero at theta equals pi in this case there's no conclusion because here I have pi and here I have pi so because I have pi in the denominator uh, at some point to make sine zero. Uh, that's, I'm going to say that there's no conclusion at pi. Uh, so we're going to take out the pi here because there's no conclusion. But what if I get what makes this zero? Okay, so what would make that zero? Well, I would have to have something that had a sum of zero, one plus negative one or one minus one. And that's where I'm going to have theta at uh, zero and two pi over three, three and 4 pi over 3. So let me clean this up a little bit and be clear on what I'm saying my 
answers are. And I guess we'll just pick black for our final conclusions. So these are my final conclusions. Because I had pi that would give me a zero in both the numerator and the denominator, I'm going to say at theta equals pi, there's no conclusion. No conclusion. Now, pi over 3, positive and negative, didn't uh, work out to where it's going to kind of contradict each other the way pi did. So I'm going to have horizontal tangent lines at positive and negative pi over 3. And I can have a vertical tangent line at 0. 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. And I guess I didn't really need my calculator for that one, although it is asking us, you, you can check your my conclusions on a graphing calculator, but let's see what we have. I'm saying at pi, there's no solution, so or there's no conclusion. So at theta equals pi, uh, that's when sine is going to be uh, 1. No, cosine will be negative 1, but sine will be 0. Uh, and, and that is going to kind of put us back here where that dimple is. We can't really see what I'm doing here. But at let's look at the horizontal tangent lines at positive pi over 3 and negative pi over 3. Well, this is pi over 6, this dotted line that we have here, this is going to be pi negative, I should say, pi over 3. This is negative pi over 3, this negative dotted line here. And there's my horizontal tangent line at that one. This is going to be positive pi over 6, the first dotted line that you see. The second dotted line that you see here, that is positive pi over 3. There's my horizontal tangent line there at uh, when x was, uh, or, or we're at an angle of 0, I have a vertical tangent line here. And at, pos at 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3, uh, those are going to be this angle that we have here and this angle that we have here. And there's the vertical tangent lines that we have at those two angles. But feel free, like I said, to check it on a graphing calculator, but that is where we're going to get the uh, horizontal and vertical tangent lines. Uh, keeping in mind specifically the new skill that we're talking about here as far as what is the derivative of the uh, polar function, the polar equation that it was given to you. Uh, remember, you have to find the derivative of x and the derivative of y and then put them in the ratio dy dx to have the true derivative of the equation. So now that we have the uh, now that we have the tangent the, the way that we can find the derivatives, now what it's asking us to do is, you know, can we get the derivatives of a tangent line? Uh, can we write the equation essentially, or can we identify what the slope of the tangent line is going to be? Uh, and that's what this one is going to be doing. Can we find the slope of a tangent line? So what it's talking about here, f of a, or f of alpha, really that's what that says, f of alpha is what it looks like is equal to zero. And if the derivative of that is not equal to zero, then the line theta is equal to alpha is tangent at the, to the, at the pole of the graph, meaning pole meaning the origin, of uh, r is equal to f of theta. So what is it telling us in the note? If you find the zeros of the polar equation, uh, they can help you find the tangent lines at the pole. Yeah, that's always kind of what we've been doing. That makes sense. Uh, in the next example, the three-leafed rose curve has more than one tangent line at the pole. Uh, and that'll make sense when we see what it looks like. So the first thing that it's giving us here, and this is what I would encourage you to try to do independently at this point, find the derivative. What is uh, 
dy dx in this case. So feel free to go ahead and pause the uh, pause the video and work this one out. Uh, but otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and presume that you've done that, and now you're just kind of checking your work with me. So x, uh, remember, is r cosine of theta. And in this case, they're giving me the radius to be 4 sine of 3 theta. So I'm going to say x is equal to 4 sine of 3 theta times cosine of theta. And the derivative of that is going to be interesting because we have the product rule and the chain rule that we're going to have to worry about. So the derivative, and I'm going to just write this one as x prime. Uh, here, if I take the 4 sine of 3 theta and leave that alone, 4 sine of 3 theta, and I take the derivative of cosine, that'll be negative sine of theta. And then I'm going to say plus, so I have to use the chain rule on the 4 sine theta, or 4 sine of 3 theta, so that's going to become... 12 cosine 3 theta times the cosine of theta. So when I simplify that, I'm going to have a negative 4 sine of 3 theta times sine of theta plus and this one, we don't really need the second part. It's just going to stay the same. Cosine of 3 theta times the cosine of theta. I know, that's like the prettiest derivative I have ever seen. Uh, so now let's do the y value. So y is going to be uh, r times the sine of theta. So, substituting the r value that they gave us, r is going to be 4 sine of 3 theta times sine of theta. And so now I need to find the derivative. So here I'm going to just say y prime for the derivative. And I'm going to have to use the chain rule again. And the derivative of the first bit, I'm going to just leave that alone. Or the first part I'm going to leave alone. So it's going to be 4 sine of 3 theta, the derivative of sine is going to give me times cosine of theta, plus, uh, so we have to use the chain rule on the 4 sine of theta, so that's going to be plus 12 cosine of 3 theta times the sine of theta. And that one is where we can stop. So the overall derivative of dy dx is going to be uh, 4 sine of 3 theta times the cosine of theta plus 12 cosine of 3 3 theta times the sine of theta all of it divided by negative 4 mm -hmm, sine theta plus 12 cosine 3 theta cosine theta. Ugh. Well, there you go. There's your derivative. And now, what we're going to use, this is what we're, this is, we really need our calculator for this, because otherwise we're going to just start hating life, trying to substitute theta values into that derivative. It's asking us to calculate the slopes of the tangent lines of the curve at that pole. Okay, well, this is just like every other derivative that we've done. We actually know what we've done, the derivative is the expression to give us the value of the slope of the tangent lines. Now we need to substitute the input numbers, 0, pi over 3, and 2 pi over 3, to actually find out what the value of the slope is at the tangent line. And this is where you want to take these numbers. So I would start with 0, and I would actually just save 0 save into something. I saved it on memory spot A. Okay. 
And then I'm going to type that whole ugly thing, and I'm going to say dy, and do it on your calculator. Make sure you can do it. dy dx uh, at theta is equal to 0. Theta is equal to 0. Uh, type all of that into your calculator. Uh, and make sure, you, again, save, save the 0 in your calculator. It's going to be very easy to kind of replicate the process uh, if you do it this one time. And we're going to get a 0. Okay, you're because you're well, you're going to wind up with zero over 12, but ultimately winds up with a zero. Now, hopefully, you typed the entire thing on your calculator the, the, the whole function with the fraction feature that your calculator does. And now I want to take this one and save it in A again. I'm going to just kick out the zero. And so, basically, what I can do is I can just kind of arrow back up on my calculator, grab that whole thing. And now I have my new value saved in A, but I don't have to retype the whole stinking function. So I'm going to have dy dx here at theta is equal to pi over 3. And this works out to be the square root of 3. Make sure you can get it on your calculator. And then once I have that number, I'm going to take the, another, the, the 2 pi over 3 here, and I'm going to save that in A. And I'm going to just arrow up on my calculator, grab that whole long, complicated expression, and then just hit enter again. And I'm going to say dy dx at theta is equal to 2 pi over 3 gives me negative radical 3. So those are the values of the slopes of the tangent line. Now, what we were saying at the beginning is says, uh, go, going back to what the original problem was asking us, or not this one here. This is what we're looking at. Uh, in the next example, the three-leaf uh, rows has more than one tangent line at the pole. Okay, well, remember, the pole is the origin. So I'm going to have a horizontal tangent, and you can't see that because that is super uh, bright. Uh, so I'm going to have a tangent line here. Okay which kind of matches the fact that I have a value of a slope of 0. I'm going to have something positive, radical 3, going through the origin. So I'm going to have something here that would be a positive radical 3. And I'm going to have a negative something here. OK? So that's where the three tangent lines are going to be at the pole for that three-leafed uh, rows function. Now, real quick, just to make sure everybody understands why it's three. Again, side lesson. I know we're long on time, but you know, if I have uh, y is equal to uh, sine of three theta, like this is three. In this case, is the number of leaves or petals that it has, whatever you want to call it, OK? If I had uh, y is equal to sine of 4 theta, I would double that. OK? So odd numbers tell you exactly how many leaves or petals that there are. Uh, and even numbers, we double them to get the number of leaves or petals uh, that there would be. Uh, and because it is cyclical, uh, it would actually be really easy to figure out what the angle would be. Uh, we could just say 360 divided by uh, 3, or uh, 360 divided by 2 pi, and or I'm sorry, 2 pi divided by 3. And we can start seeing you know, the angles kind of between. OK, so this would be like 120 degrees. And I would go another 120 degrees and another 120 degrees. And that's how I'm getting my three uh, petals there. Anyway, but anyway, this is this is what we're going for. This is the value of the slopes. The, so again, just a little, little mini lesson, side lesson there. OK. So in this case, they're giving us a graph of uh, dy d theta, uh, and it's it's just looking 
uh, from zero to pi is what the graph is giving us here. It says, using graphing utility to find the locations of all horizontal tangent lines and discuss any uh, significance of these points. Well, the horizontal tangent lines that they're referring to are are really going to be looking at the rows, not not the graph that was given us given to us here. So, because it's telling us graph, uh, the it's just saying the dy d theta. We're only looking at the numerator that we were given from that we had from our derivative. So, I my numerator from the derivative was four sine of three theta uh, cosine of theta plus 12 cosine 3 theta sine theta. That was what we had from our derivative. And what I want to know is when is it equal to zero? Uh, so it equals zero when we're at zero. Uh, or I'm sorry, I should say when theta uh, is 0, pi over 2, or at pi. That's where we're going to wind up with something that's going to make that whole thing equal to 0. So what we're trying to look at is to see where do those points correspond on to, uh, you know, the rectangular function that was given to us. Well, if I try solving this, again, this is one of the things I'm using my calculator for. I'm going to get theta to be approximately equal to uh, 0 0.65905 and 2.4825. Well, if I solve that function and I find where it correlates to it, uh, the rectangular coordinates, well, that's going to be this point here and this point here. This is the 0 0.65905, and this is the, uh, where was it, 2.4825. Now, what I'm going to be looking at here, the way that I'm trying to identify this, is I'm going to I want to convert some polar coordinates into rectangular coordinates. Okay, so remember x was equal to four sine of 3 theta cosine theta y was equal to 4 sine of 3 theta times the sine of theta and I'm, I'm really just looking at the x values so when x is 0 y was 0 when x was uh, and I'm just kind of looking at the, uh, converting my points here, uh, I got a 2.905 basically and a 2.25 and I got a 0 and a negative 4, I got a negative 2.905 and a 2.25 and a 0 and a 0 when I'm kind of converting some points here. And the values, this is what we're trying to illustrate here. These values, value, oof. these values represent the roots
of the rectangular function and the minimums, mins, the min or the max of the polar function. Ugh. I know I don't have great handwriting, but the pen is wanting to stick to the board for some reason. Polar function. That's a little better. So go back to the uh, go back to the points that you had on the on the rectangular or on the polar function here. Okay. What is that maximum here? Or, or the maximum here and the maximum here and the minimum here. Okay. Uh, and, and, and see what you wind up getting. And those are going to correspond to the roots of the rectangular function. Okay, so like I said, there was a lot of stuff to unpack here. We're almost done. Just bear with me here. So now we're still moving on. We're still looking at the same, you know, function here. Find the three points where the absolute value of R is a maximum. Uh, show that the tangent line is perpendicular to the line segment connecting the point to the origin. Okay, so this is kind of where we were going back to... Uh, things that we were talking about previously as far as getting the derivative to find the values of the slopes of the tangent lines and so on. So we have the function r is equal to 4 sine of 3 theta. That's what we were given with uh, to begin with. Okay. Well, for something like this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that Set equal to uh, pi over 2 and I'm going to solve for theta. Okay, so I'm going to just, I mean, because basically what we're going to, if you can set the whole thing equal to 0 and that's ultimately what we're going to be working with is just the 3 theta. So if I say 3 theta and I set it equal to pi over 2 and I solve for theta, in this case, I'm going to wind up getting theta to be pi over 6. Okay, well, where is pi over 6 on the polar function? It's right there, that dotted line, which is going to take us to that point right there. Okay. Now, what I was talking about earlier, the little side lesson that I was giving you, the, let me pick a different color here. And I don't have, I, I'm not sure where to write this here. Let's go ahead and just erase this bit here, because we've already got that down. The 3 and 3 theta says that there will be three leaves to the graph. So if you take the total number of degrees, 360, and you divide it by three, that's 120 degrees. Uh, or if you say two pi divided by three, that would just be two pi radians. Uh, two pi three intervals between the leaves. So if I count 2 pi, uh, 2 pi over 3 intervals between the leaves, uh, between the leaves I should say, 
or 120 degrees, if that's easier for you to do in your head, uh, that is going to take me right to here. Okay. So what is that angle on the uh, unit circle or the polar graph that we see here? Well, that angle in this case is going to be uh, 5 pi over 6. And if I go another 120 degrees or another 2 pi intervals from here to here, okay, that puts me at 3 pi over 2 to have another maximum value that we're going to get there. So my polar coordinates that I'm going to be getting, and I'll go ahead and do this one here, is going to be when r is equal to 4 and the theta is 3 pi over 2. And we'll go back to this pink color here. Here I'm going to have this polar coordinate to have an r value of 4 and 5 pi over 6 for the theta value. And let's go back to blue. And this point right here is going to have an r value of 4 and theta of just pi over 6. So those are the coordinates uh, for the extrema, for the maximums of the rows here. Okay? So let's see. What is it telling us to do? Show that the tangent line is perpendicular to the line segment connecting the point to the origin. Well, so the, let's look at this blue one here because I get it. that's what I have. All right. So we have that line segment there. That's what's the segment that's connecting it to the origin. So we want something that's going to be perpendicular to it. Okay. And clearly that's going to be negative. And we already had something that uh, was negative. So let's look at our derivative. So hopefully you still have this on the calculator. If I say dy dx on my calculator at theta e is equal to pi over 6, that's going to give you negative radical 3. Okay? So the slope of a tangent line there, the slope, you know, so something perpendicular to that line in quadrant 1 is going to be a positive radical 3 over 3. So that's the slope of what we're looking at here. Because this slope here would be the negative radical 3. So the perpendicular one would be positive radical 3, or yeah, positive radical 3 over 3. So if we go to the next one, which I'm doing, I guess, in pink, okay? If I say dy dx, what is the value of the derivative when theta is equal to? Uh, 5 pi over 6, type that into your calculator, and you're going to get a square root of 3. So the, per so the tangent line is going to be that guy right there. So the perpendicular line, this one right here, something that's going to be perpendicular to that, opposite reciprocal, multiply by 1 over the square root of 3, or negative 1 over the square root of 3, and I'm going to wind up with negative radical 3, over 3 for the perpendicular line connecting it to the origin and so we have one more and that one you should you can clearly see that one's going to be undefined because if I take and what, what do we do orange here if I look at the derivative on that one dy dx at theta is equal to what was that 3 pi over 2 we wound up getting a 0 and something that's going to be perpendicular to that is going to be undefined. So here, here's a slope of zero t perpendicular or tangent to the uh, point there, and there's your undefined perpendicular line uh, to it. So the last thing that we're asked to do for this example, we got one more to go. Oh, did I miss it? Oh, in your notes, there's one more thing to go. All right, hold on a second. Hold on a second. 
Okay, so there's the last example that's in your notes. I apologize for that not being there. I missed it apparently. Write the equation for the tangent line that passes through the point uh, 4 and pi over 6. Well, that 4 and pi over 6, this is, uh, oh, let me go back to this one here. I don't know what color am I looking at? That will work. This is a point that we're looking at. We want something that's going to be perpendicular to that. Uh, I'm sorry, we want the slope of the tangent line there. And so we know the slope of the tangent line. We've already figured that to be uh, negative square root of 3. So we just need to know what are the what's the point there. So I have to take that point, which is this right here as a rectangular form, and I have to convert it into uh, did I say rec that's polar form, and I need to convert it into rectangular form. So again, we have x is equal to r cosine of theta. Uh, so in this case, they're saying that r cosine of theta is going to be uh, the function that we're with here. We have x in this case is going to be equal to uh, 4 for the radius, cosine of pi over 6 for theta, and cosine of pi over 6 is going to be radical 3 over 2, and so that would simplify for an x-coordinate to be just 2 radical 3. And now we need our y-coordinate, so y is equal to r sine theta, so the r value that was given to us was 4, the theta value that was given to us sine, the theta value that was given to us again was just pi over 6, uh, so y is equal to 4 times sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, so my y value is 2, so my rectangular coordinates are 2 radical 3 and 2. So there's the rectangular coordinates. We know the slope uh, from the previous problem was negative radical 3. And so my the equation of my tangent line would be uh, negative radical 3 times x minus 2 radical 3 plus 2. And there's the slope of the tangent line. So... Quite a lot of information on this one, uh, useful information, not all of it terribly difficult. The derivative, the d, dy over d theta and the dx over d theta, uh, that one was a bit lengthy, uh, trying to work some of that stuff out. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this up now. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you learned some stuff. Be good. Take care of yourselves. So.